So good afternoon and welcome to all of you on behalf of the ELISE team and particularly on behalf of the ELISE knowledge transfer team. Today, uh, Giacomo Martirano and myself, uh, Simon Vrechar, uh, both uh, um, consultants working for Joint Research Centers of European Commission, uh, will be hosting uh, this webinar with the, with the, of the ELISE Action Series with the title uh, 3D City Models uh, to Predict uh, Energy Heat Demand. So maybe uh, at the beginning, a few words about the ELISA action, as you can see on the next slide. So uh, the European Location Interoperability for uh, Solutions for E-Government, that's what actually ELISA stands for, uh, is an action uh, part of, uh, of ISA uh, Square program. So it's an European uh, interoperability program uh, aiming uh, to providing uh, providing cross border and uh, uh, cross sector interoperability solutions for public administrations, uh, citizens, and businesses. There are more than fifty actions uh, tackling interoperability from different angles, while the Elisa action is the only one focusing on the location dimension. Uh, since uh, the adoption of the ISA Square program in 2016, ELISA has supported uh, uh, building a location-enabled digital uh, government. Uh, and uh, the, 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 this concept actually builds on the three, three important um, um, uh, elements, digital transformation, location, and interoperability. Uh, so ELISA at the end with uh, all the, the, the outputs and good practices and legacy uh, are providing and will provide uh, inputs uh, to future activities within the Digital Euro program uh, related in improving um, and uh, enhancing the European interoperability. Um, as you can see on the next slide, uh, ELISA aims to uh, break down barriers and promote a coherent and uh, 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 consistent approach uh, to sharing and uh, reusing of location data across the sectors uh, and, and, uh, and borders. Um, in the context of digital transformation of public services, doing by supporting different uh, policy initiatives um, at, on European and national level, uh, by providing uh, uh, reusable, uh, interoperable cross-border and cross-sector frameworks and solutions for public administrations, businesses, and citizens, by discovering how um, emerging trends and uh, technology, technologies enable more effective use of location data for policy and, and digital public services. And last but not least, by building a geo-knowledge base uh, to um, inform and train stakeholders and promote the adoption of good practices um, and innovation in location uh, uh, data. So uh, all this is being done through different types of outputs, as you can see on the next slide, by carrying out studies uh, um, uh, to develop, by developing a framework of guidelines and recommendations and reusable tools, by developing different pilots and applications. So the part of those we'll discuss also today, and by, uh, of course, um, uh, building a set um, uh, geo-knowledge uh, based service. And uh, all this is, uh, let's say, covered by different uh, topics, variety of topics that could be, uh, that are also mentioned on the uh, right part um, of, of the slides. Um, okay, let's, let's move to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, in the five years of, uh, of ELISE, uh, there were some achievements, let's say, uh, uh, that are, uh, actually complementing the European interoperability framework and NIFO with extensive location. Uh, interoperability framework and state of play assessment uh, helped out the inspired directive uh, uh, into practice with tools for data providers and strong focus on use cases. Uh, built an extensive community of European and international stakeholders. Just to mention here, maybe the active engagement of ISA Square member uh, states. And uh, last but not least, uh, raised awareness of new approaches to location-enabled and digital transformation. There are as well uh, other, uh, let's say, achievements uh, that we won't uh, go more into the details. Uh, so to achieve all these objectives, uh, as you can see on the next slide, knowledge transfer activity uh, plays, plays a central role. 
so knowledge transfer, uh, we are understanding usually the complex process of this disseminating knowledge uh, from one individual uh, team or organization to another. Uh, but um, we, we've done this, uh, let's say, on the on the on the Elise with uh, three uh, main aims: to establishing um, a mutually beneficial collaborative community with these uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, by creating an um, uh, um, interactive environment, uh, enabling co-creation and open innovation, and to turning inputs into the uh, actionable knowledge okay coming back to the to the to the uh, webinar today as you can see on the next slide uh, we have uh, our speakers two speakers today uh, professor dr volker kors for scientific director from institute of applied research in stuttgart germany and Hema Hernandez Moral, a project manager and researcher by uh, Cardiff uh, Foundation in Spain. Uh, so at this moment, I would uh, maybe ask Giacomo to share with us uh, what will be, let's say, on the menu today. So please, Giacomo, if you can share that with us. Thank you very much, Simon, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, thanks to you all for having uh, joined uh, us in this webinar. So we will uh, uh, have uh, quickly an introduction. Uh, we already had uh, uh, an introduction to the ELISA action by um, Simon. Then I will uh, guide you through quickly into the uh, energy and location applications of ELISA, which is one of the branches uh, ELISA dealt with. Then we will have the two presentations from our guest speakers, State of the Art of Heating Demand Predictions by Volker, and how different data sources and different simulation environments affect energy heat demand predictions by HEMA. Then we will have uh, um, some uh, guided uh, interaction with the key messages, challenges, and future outlook. And then we will conclude with questions and answers. And meanwhile, uh, Simon will help, help us in uh, uh, um, playing with some uh, polls uh, to get your, your feedback. Yes, indeed, Giacomo. So before uh, in giving you the total control <laughs> of the of the of the webinar, so maybe uh, before moving uh, forward, uh, we are asking you the first uh, question in the polls you can see on your screen. So uh, you are kindly invited to share with us uh, what is your affiliation. So are you from the EU public administration, national public administration, regional or local public administration, academia research, uh, private company, non from profit NGO association, are you maybe freelancer or are you maybe student, citizen or something other? If you forgot something, just please type, <laughs> type in the chat box if we were not so much uh, without imagination, let's say. So let's have uh, maybe another five seconds. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, let's share the results with you. Uh, so uh, apparently the most of you are coming from the universities, so research organizations, uh, then from the national public administrations, and then regional local public administration and students. So I think we have now, uh, uh, it's now the time that Giacomo starts uh, sharing with us the, uh, the details about the ELISA energy uh, and location application. Please, Giacomo. Okay, thank you, Simon. So uh, let's go. Elise uh, has developed besides the studies, recommendations, solutions, uh, framework solutions, and, and other types of activities, we worked on uh, pilot applications. And we developed uh, cross-border pilots and applications to test location data interoperability principles in, in, in the following sectors. In the marine sector, supporting member states in the management of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive related spatial uh, information. And here uh, you will have some, the link to see some video how this was uh, achieved. In the transport sector, developing and sharing best practices in the context of the ITS, the Intelligent Transport System Directive, 
We touched also the cultural heritage sector, exploiting a pan-European gazetteer, gazetteer service for which a deliver, public deliverable is available. And uh, today we will uh, uh, go into more details in the, uh, in the sector, which is uh, interesting for us, the energy efficiency, supporting public administrations, businesses and citizens engaged in energy policies cycle. The, uh, let's say the principles and the methodologies applied, uh, we, are, we, we focused on these two main points. So uh, to leverage location data at building level as an enabling factor to scale up a set of methodologies to assess energy efficiency from local uh, to district, city, and also beyond. So focusing on uh, data, uh, at the most granular level possible, at building level, sometimes at building units uh, of a good quality. And of course, to use uh, this location-based data to support different types of stakeholders engaged in energy efficiency policies cycle, following the ISA square paradigm to uh, look at the, uh, um, to, to provide benefits for public administrations, businesses, and citizens. We focused on buildings because uh, all these figures, uh, you know, are very dynamically uh, updated according also to the very active uh, period in which uh, several policy instruments are going to be uh, updated. But uh, these are some uh, key uh, figures uh, highlighting the importance to focus on buildings because they are responsible for the 40% of final energy consumption. Over 75% of building stock is older than 25 years. And then, as you can see, the kilowatt per square meter of final energy consumption is really uh, uh, consistent. And extens extensive renovation of buildings could cut 36% of the energy consumption by 2030. And uh, you also are aware how these, uh, all these aspects are uh, becoming a consistent part in the, also in the uh, recovery and resilience national uh, plans. How we um, tried to cover all these aspects, uh, co-designing and co-executing together with a set of partners in the frame of a, a multilateral collaboration uh, agreement, a set of use cases. Here is the list uh, just to, to, to see how we tried to sample the complex uh, energy efficiency ecosystem uh, in a not in a fully exhaustive way, but we tried to, um, to, to cover several aspects, starting from the generalization to, to, to deal with uh, public lighting, uh, uh, promoting uh, a best practice of a digital platform to manage the public lighting, then uh, harmonizing energy performance certificates of buildings, which uh, the, thanks to this harmonization, the, um, a lot of uh, um, support can be made to decision makers, as well as harmonizing the uh, data um, provided uh, by the COM signatories in their sustainable energy and climate action plans, uh, assessing energy performance of buildings uh, using energy consumption data from smart meters, and also investigating the role of geospatial information in a regional energy strategy. But today, the use case uh, uh, was results will be illustrated today together with the other uh, aspects uh, related to that is the harmonization of energy simulations to assess the energy heat uh, demand of uh, buildings. And uh, I think that at this uh, stage, I hand over to Volker that can ask control to be um, to self manage the slides. Yes, in the meantime, uh, for Sorry. to prepare uh, himself, uh, we will ask uh, uh, against the uh, again the audience uh, about the question. So it is dealing with the uh, with the section that Volker is will be dealing with. So have you ever dealt with the predictions of the heating demand of the buildings using 3D city models? So to see a bit um, if you have experiences with that. Mm -hmm. So 55, 58% answer, so maybe Take another five seconds. Okay, so now more the, the two thirds of perfect. So let's share the results. Uh, so it looks like the most of you have uh, have already dealt with uh, 
predictions of the heating demand of the building using 3D city models. Interesting. So please, uh, Volker, uh, now you know about a bit more about the audience. So uh, the floor is yours. So, I mean, thank you. I can't share the video or my video. <laughs> That's in a way blocked. So, but um, you need to move the the slides, Volker. Yeah, um, I can move the slides, but. So that works, but I can't share the video. Anyway, um, um, so yeah, um, welcome. What's from my side? Um, if fifty percent already know um, or have dealt with three D city models um, and and uh, simulation, maybe I um, can skip some information. But uh, we will see. Yeah, just feel free to to ask details as well. Yeah. So in the um, project Giacomo introduced, we carried out simulations um, in this mentioned use case in um, three European countries, in, in Germany, the Netherlands, and in Spain, in um, city of Essen with a Citium L, LOD1 and LOD2 model. LOD1 is a extruded footprint, so it's a box model in that sense, and LOD2 has a detailed roof structure. The same we did with, uh, um, ah, no, video sharing works, thanks. Um, the same we did with, um, with uh, um, data from the Netherlands Cataster in, in Swolle um, and with, um, in a use case in, in Enskede as well with, um, say, additional information. I will talk about this later on um, Dutch building physics library. Um, and in Valladolid, we used um, two different data sets to compare things. And um, Gemma will give more details on, on this um, experiment. So that's the uh, motivation. That's how 3D environment looks like in, uh, in this case. It's in this so-called LOD2 model. And uh, as, as mentioned, private household um, is, um, say, responsible for about 40% of the CO2 emissions from the, mainly from the heating um, sector. Yeah, so that's one strong motivation to say, okay, that needs to be reduced if we want to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, and that is um, an, a study that I found quite interesting because I think it shows quite well what can be achieved with the, with the work we have did before this pilot because, um, and that's why I, I want to highlight this work as well that was done um, last year um, together with the city of Helsinki. That was not part of the, um, of, of the pilot, but of course used the same um, tool, same approach um, to answer the question, what is the strategy or strategy works at phasing key? They have the goal to become carbon neutral in 2035. And for the um, building sector, for the heating demand, what, what are um, strategies and how do they contribute to this um, CO2 reduction? Yeah? And you see here on, on the, um, say on the, on the 3D model, um, picture um, based on the energy demand prediction. Um, we issued some kind of, a, um, of an um, energy performance label, not a certificate, but a label, just a color code um, to give indicators. Um, and this whole calculation is based on both um, current state with current conditions and future prediction. It's assuming refurbishments, assuming um, climate change predictions as well. Yeah, so these scenarios until 30, 2035 or 2050 take into account climate projections from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. And then we see how heating demand goes up or down. <laughs> And in the, in, in the first graph, you see a so-called business as usual scenario. So we assume nothing changes. 
then surprisingly or not surprisingly, because we talk about climate change, uh, heating demand goes down already yeah? because temperature goes up mainly in winter. So there's not that much demand for heating. But of course, um, the reduction is not as it should be to achieve this goal to become carbon neutral. Um, and if you, the second diagram shows um, a higher refurbishment rate scenario with a 3% refurbishment, but also um, a change in district heating um, network and heat production in this district heating um, network based on renewables. And that is a special situation here. I think key most of the buildings um, use are connected to district heating. So that has the biggest impact for, for Helsinki in this case. But that also means you have to take individual solution for the city. There's no silver bullet to say, if you do this, that would work, but it depends on the situation. And that's why from my perspective, this method to simulate these scenarios and play around with different parameters and see what is a good strategy and the impact is quite essential. And that's why we developed this, this tool called Simstad, where we um, calculate heating demand by um, taking into account um, solar gains, internal gains, heat, trans heat loss transmissions, ventilation losses, and not only heating, but also hot water um, demand or heating for hot water in that sense. Yeah. So this goes um, into our system and we and the challenge is we have a deterministic problem. Okay, that's physics, that's known. It depends on the data quality. And here with the 3D model, we have a much better representation of the building geometry because we have 3D, we know the volume, not only the footprint, but we have this stochastic phenomenon of um, user behavior. Yeah, the occupancy of course plays a role as well. And that is, um, difficult to, to simulate. So we don't simulate every citizen in a building, but we um, just use, um, say, um, load profiles derived from measured load profiles in that sense. So no standard load profile, but um, a statistical model that is based on, on standard load profile, uh, on, on real measured um, profiles. Um, here you see the overall architecture of the system. I will not go into details here, but the main message is we have the 3D city model. We have some additional attributes. We need to validate this. Of course, quality management is important. And if we have gaps in the data, we use building typologies to, um, to make assumptions. Now for, for the unknown part, what is not in the data set, we assume based on building typology, um, which, um, for example, which you value the, the walls have uh, for heat transmission. Um, here's a an, an case study we um, recently um, did, and that gives an overview what is the result of this kind of simulation. Uh, here's a small, um, city district in, in Stuttgart, Wiener Platz, where you see the heating demand um, over a year in, on hourly um, basis on the heating demand. The orange part is hot water demand that's assumed to be um, constant and um, heat losses due to um, utilities. Yeah? And, and in addition, you have, um, you, you simulate PV potential. Um, that is something we do in addition on a yearly base and on a daily base uh, because yeah, power can be used for heating as well. So that is um, something important. How can we control or configure our system? Um, as I mentioned, we use building physics libraries and that was uh, the case in, in the Netherlands. The default building physics library we use is a German one yeah, for obvious reasons, but um, in the, the Enskede use case, we developed a um, building physics library for the Netherlands. And um, that is based on the, the Tabula project. So we can adapt the systems to national specific building physics libraries. Then we can um, define scenarios with the assumption on the refurbishment rate 
etc. Yeah, that is not required if you want to calculate um, the current state of heating demand, but of course it's important to have this possibility to calculate future scenarios and as well um, weather and climate um, scenarios. Yeah, we need to, we, here we rely on predictions of the um, weather forecasts or um, meteorological institutes. Here is an example of, of the different scenarios um, of the German weather forecast. Um, and yeah, here it's distinguished between 10 year predictions and 30 to 100 year projections. And you see how this differs, but even the most, um, say, positive scenario has a um, raise in um, heating uh, in temperature. Yeah? So that is. Um, that is something that needs to be taken into account, which means um, um, that there will be a change for sure. Yeah? So here's um, another example in the Netherlands with the city of Rotterdam. That's some project we also based on the work we did in, in the pilot um, we used here. And in this case, that is interesting because we um, again adapted the building physics library of the Netherlands to city specific things. So we spend a lot of time with the energy department in Rotterdam to adapt um, the building physics library. Um, this is, is shared as um, open source or open data, the building physics library, as well as a simulation tool. It's not open source, but um, free. And as temperatures go up, we thought, okay, we also need to take into account cooling, not only heating. And um, we, we have a case study in, in Singapore as well, where you only talk about Cooling. So that works as well with the simulation because um, it's, if it's negative heating, you need cooling yeah, in that sense. And here you see some kind of comparison between simulated cooling demand in Singapore and real consumption in Singapore. And what was surprising to me in a way that compared to the German heating demand, cooling demand in Singapore is higher. Yeah? Um, so, and, and with the rates of temperatures, I, um, I think we also need to talk about um, the cooling um, demand in, in Europe yeah, that we require. And if we don't do anything, then most likely people will do cooling with, um, with by power. Yeah? So, and we also plan the power for electricity, for cars, etc. And the, the, this picture shows one difficulty we have. So there are, of course, uncertainties. This is a very typical architecture in Singapore. And in our method, we detect roofs and we assume a roof is on top of a building. But here, it's on top of um, pathways, yeah? it's a good shadow. But we, for, for yeah, um, we are. We did not take this into account, so we count these as buildings as well. So in a way, we um, we do some errors based on semantic errors in the in, in our interpretation of the data set. So that is of course a challenge um, that we did not um, took into account so far because this type of architecture is not very common in Europe. Uh, with this, I would um, thank you for listening and hope I gave you some overview of what we did in the project and beyond um, with the work we, we or with the tools the methodologies we developed in the project. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Volker. So uh, while uh, uh, Emma is uh, preparing, uh, we will uh, launch another um, question, another poll. Uh, so after you've uh, listened and seen the presentation by Volker, maybe you can answer on following questions. So are predictions of heating demand of building using 3D city models applied in your city or town or living environment? So are you aware of that at all? So maybe let's wait another five to seconds.
Okay, so let's finalize the polling. What are the results? So uh, no, in most cases, no, it's 46%, 30% you do, yes. So there are some uh, models applied and uh, about quarter of you don't know. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, give the floor to Hema uh, to see how different data sources and different simulations environment affect energy heat demands prediction. Please, Hema. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much for for being here. Uh, we are going to cover in this part of the of the session uh, the work that we have carried out specifically in the case study in Spain. Uh, where we tackled um, a comparative analysis of different methodologies uh, and data sets for energy performance labeling in buildings. We focused specifically in a city in Valladolid and we worked both at, at city scale and at district scale in Valladolid and Cuatro de Marzo. You will see later on. Um, Ah, yeah. The objectives were three, uh, to analyze the different data generation approaches. So it's very important where uh, the data comes from, uh, what type of processing it needs to, to undergo, because uh, sometimes some errors or assumptions can be done in this process and it can distort uh, the results. Then uh, we wanted to analyze the impact of using different simulation tools. In this case, we used uh, Simstat, as explained by, by Volker in the previous presentation that was developed by the Hochschule of Stuttgart and Energies, which was developed by Cartiv. They are similar in their scope and that's why we, we compare them. And we also try to compare uh, the results with the most, uh, the closest real uh, data that we could have that are the energy performance certificates uh, which in the case of uh, the Castilla León region where Valladolid is located, um, there is basic data publicly available. So that's what we what we took for this work. So um, what we did is uh, to focus on the data and the simulation environments considered and then perform some uh, validations for the um, data and simulation environments considered. As I said before, it's very important to know the data sources, where does your data come from? And we um, focused on four main sources. I will explain them uh, in more detail uh, later on. Uh, some have to, have to deal with um, specifically generating the models for a specific purpose, and others have to do with uh, taking advantage of publicly available data and what you can do with it. Based on these data sources, we generated some data input that was at district level or at city scale. And in some cases, we, we had that uh, data input for both uh, cases. As I said before, um, we used two simulation environments, Simstat, as explained by Volker, and Energies. And depending on the, on the data input, uh, we could use one or, or the other. Uh, Simstad uh, uses as input data CTGMLs. That's why every time that we had a CTGML, we run it by, by Simstad. And Energies works in, in 2D. So uh, that's why we uh, check this with the GMLs coming from the Spanish cadaster. And then the validation was structured in the in same three pillars that I explained before, the data sources, the simulation environments, and the and the comparison with real EPCs and the two different scales in each case. So you can see here the combination of validations that we did um, and we tried to extract conclusions uh, from there. So um, with respect to the data sources and data input, um, we are working in, in data coming from the city Valladolid in, in Spain, which is located in mid Spain to the north. Um, and in particular, focusing in this um, district, Cuatro de Marzo, which you can see here more clearly, um, it is a, um, a district which is very well easy to analyze, so, so to say, because uh, there are a lot of uh, building blocks which are the same. We have 
two main typologies, uh, some building blocks that are five stories high, and we have also some, some towers. So in this sense, we have a, a, quite a lot of buildings, but easy to analyze because uh, we only have different orientations and the distribution and typology is the same. So it was a good place to start. Of course, when considering the city as a whole in Valladolid, we have uh, all sorts of buildings, but well. Um, and here I would like to explain the different uh, data sources that we used. Uh, first of all, um, a one ad hoc generation of models. Uh, this was a model of part of the, um, of the district of Cuatro de Mazo, which was uh, developed uh, manually by using one uh, SketchUp plugin. It was done um, for, for another project, so the aims were, were different, but we also used it here. And it was developed at the beginning uh, based on height sign and dimensions based on building plans. So the um, reliability of the, of the model was uh, quite high. Then we have the Spanish cadaster. Um, it is available for, for all Spain and we have uh, buildings and building parts uh, in 2D. And the AFO somehow uh, inspired almost in, in 2D. Um, and we used it directly for the energies too, or uh, as a source to generate models in CTGML in LOD, LOD1. Then also we complemented uh, some of this data that we obtained from the, from the cadaster for um, the Cuatro de Marzo district. You can see that it is uh, the same. And we combined it with a uh, LiDAR data. This data is um, it's a cloud, there are cloud points and we combine them with this uh, 2D data to obtain the real heights of the, of the buildings. This way we could have some accurate um, building heights because in other cases, for instance, when using the Spanish cadaster or when using uh, open street maps, we had to, to implement some assumptions. So for instance, in case of the Spanish cadaster, consider that every floor um, is three meters high or in the case of open street maps, when we didn't have even the number of floors, which is quite uh, usual that this happens, uh, we needed to, to implement a, a, an assumption. In this case, we considered if we didn't have information that the buildings were 15 meters high, um, so five floors uh, approx. Um, this is the case, for instance, or can be a valid assumption for, for Cuatro de Marzo, but in the case of other of other uh, districts in Valladolid, all the buildings are of different height, so it's an uh, an estimation. And now uh, we will go uh, to the simulation environment. As I said before, seems that was explained before by by Volker. And Energies um, is a tool that has the intention of. Um, uh, evaluating the, the energy demand at a local scale and a municipal scale by trying to exploit publicly available data. So not having someone model the, the, the city or the, the area that you want to evaluate, but just extracting data from the cadaster and uh, automating some uh, energy performance certificate tools, uh, which are validated at national level. In this case, we took CE3X uh, in Spain. So basically it's, um, it works in three steps. We, we take the input data from, from the cadaster, then we generate some files and we automatically, automatically estimate the demand with the EPC calculation tool. Um, and then we, we represent it. So those are the steps followed uh, there. Uh, then I would like to focus on the validation process and the results that we obtained. Um, as I said before, there are three pillars that we covered. First, how does the generation of data sets affect the final results? This is something that we covered in, in the case study 1.1 at the district level. Then uh, we explored how the results vary in two different simulation environments that share the same objective. Uh, that is uh, Simstad and, and energies. 
and that we covered at district and, and city level. And finally, um, if the results obtained were comparable to different to real EPCs and or that we, we compared as well at district and city level. What we did in each case is try to have the inputs and the different inputs that we had and relate them to the labels and percentages of, of buildings that fell in each of the labels to have a, an overview. And we also did some pairwise comparison among the, between the different inputs and the results obtained. So uh, to see what percentage of buildings have uh, some label differences and so on. Um, I invite you to read the report once it's available, but I will go through the main results uh, now. So in the first case, um, when dealing with data sources uh, at district level, um, we found uh, this, that for instance, the, the degree of resemblance to reality is higher, of course, uh, when you generate a, a model ad hoc, or when you take, a, or you, when you complement the public data of the cadaster with some real data coming from the, um, from the cloud points of the leader data. Um, then we also found out that the energy performance is higher when, when performing ad hoc modeling, that is input two, the labels obtained were mostly D in comparison to labels E in, in other cases. And as you can see in input uh, 3, 1, D, that is uh, coming from Cadaster, uh, since it is generating by applying the same hypothesis of three meters of height per floor, uh, it offers homogeneous results because uh, if we are focusing at district level, and as I said before, the district we are tackling um, has uh, the same type of buildings, then it is obvious that we were going to obtain the, the same results. Okay, um, and now uh, we move to the second part of the, um, of the scheme. So how the results vary into different simulation environments that, same, that share the same objective. This we tried with, with SimStat and with energies. Um, we found some, at district level, we found some homogeneity of, of results when, when tackling um, inputs from cadaster and from open street maps. As I said before, this has to do with uh, the way how we process the open data from the cadaster and open street maps because the approach um, is very similar in both of them. That is why in the end, the geometry was uh, very similar and the results, as you can see here, um, are the same. Um, we obtained the same levels, labels um, with SimStat and Energies, more or less. Uh, there were some deviations in energy performance of around 25 kilowatt hour per square meter. Um, we found out that there, there is a slightly higher uh, heating energy demand uh, when, when working with uh, LiDAR um, because uh, there is, um, the geometry is more complex and you have more um, external wall surface and you have, uh, you have more heating demand. And we also find uh, when working with, with LiDAR data that some outliers were present and we needed to check them. Then at city level, um, um, it was more difficult to extract conclusions because of the var variety of, of buildings. So the, the results here are quite um, yeah, varied. Um, there are label similarities for, for inputs uh, two and, and three one. So from the cadaster uh, and the city GML generated from the cadaster. Um, then um, OSM input, OpenStreetMap input resulted in higher efficiencies, maybe because of the assumption that um, we performed at the beginning because uh, there was no so much uh, contextual information of the buildings. 
semantic information. So that could be a reason why. We would need to make an analysis of the overall building stock in Valladolid to know how far um, we are uh, when we make this type of assumption. Um, we found also extreme, extreme differences uh, for a significant number of buildings. Yeah. And then the last one, um, the last comparison we made was uh, comparing these results with real energy performance certificates, both at district and at city level. Um, of course, um, what I state here is like a caution when comparing these EPCs, because um, as you may know, energy performance certificates are issued both at a dwelling level and also at building level. So uh, we had to take care to know what to compare because it, it is not maybe representative to take one dwelling as a um, representative of a whole building and because it depends where this dwelling is located or if they have performed some refurbishment in this dwelling but not in the rest of the building and so on. Uh, but in any case, uh, when comparing a district level, we found that uh, most of the results fell in, in label E, except for the um, input what, which was generated ad hoc. And in the case of city level, like to have a um, uh, an overall view, it worked better, like the general statistics, because um, most of the inputs uh, were were around the same the same values. So, as overall conclusions of the whole process, we could say that the extraction of conclusions um, was easier if um, dealing with a um, with a smaller district, like in the case of Cuatro de Marzo, because uh, it was easy to detect where uh, some issues were, especially in the case of this district, because as I said before, we have only two building typologies. Then um, in the generation model, is, is it essential to know how they have been generated and what type of hypoth hypothesis have been applied, because this can affect uh, largely the results. Then uh, when trying to work with this uh, different uh, data sources and, and trying to match them among each other and compare them, it was essential to know the IDs of the different buildings. And it, it was a challenge when comparing the cadaster to open street maps. Uh, and even more so when the geometry didn't, wasn't uh, the same in some cases. So cadastral references were extremely useful. And the level of granularity of the mo models is also fundamental. Uh, as I said before, with the energy performance certificates, uh, it is not the same to consider buildings as a whole or, or building parts. And yeah. Then with respect to the simulation environment uh, comparison, uh, at a first glance, the overall picture seemed to be seemed that both tools offered similar results. However, a, a deeper analysis of each tool would be necessary to see how each parameter is considered. And then with respect to the comparison of EPCs, we took um, this data source because it was the closest to real data that we could get. But um, we have to know that we can only compare energy performance certificates if they exist, because not all buildings have an energy performance certificate. The level of granularity of this uh, data source is varied. It can be at dwelling level or at building level. And um, we compared uh, the value of the uh, heating energy demand label, as I said before. and. Um, we could also find outliers in the energy performance certificates, so it was necessary to process them before. Um, all in all, um, the most important comment uh, of this is that the analysis that we present we presented uh, should be seen as a, as a roadmap that needs to be further analyzed and 
of course, um, if possible, uh, compared and calibrated with, with real data. And um, in generating these uh, models and, and 3D models, uh, you need to balance the effort uh, that you need to, <laughs> to exert to generate a model with the results obtained. So it was, this was an, an interesting way to, to evaluate this somehow. So that would be all from my side. I'll leave the floor to Giacomo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for uh, uh, having uh, very nicely summarized uh, really hard work uh, made in more than two years. Um, uh, just to, to communicate that all the results uh, of these, uh, of these uh, use cases uh, um, will be soon uh, publicly uh, available in a GRC technical report, which is currently under review. And so uh, follow up on join up, follow, follow us uh, in, in, on join up to see when we will communicate when this uh, report will be, will be released. Um, so now is uh, it's time to, to move uh, to have some, uh, let's say, final um, words on some key messages and challenges and future uh, outlook. And uh, first of all, uh, despite the, um, uh, let's say, the, the several, um, uh, the results of the several of the many validations performed by, by him are presented and also uh, besides what uh, Walker, uh, Falker mentioned, uh, comparing uh, LOD1, LOD2, cooling, heating, and, and all the source of errors, we are all aware that one of the main um, limitations is related to the fact that this methodology cannot take into account uh, the user behavior uh, because it is based on the on the on the fabric on the building fabrics on the, on the physics of the buildings. Uh, and all the, uh, with the, uh, and the, on the atmospheric conditions. And regarding this aspect, I would like to um, um, to invite to, to 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 say his remark. Uh, I would invite uh, Christian Struck from uh, uh, University of Applied Science of Enschede. He was one of the of the key partners in in in, in the pilot, and uh, because he's uh, as, um, primarily experienced in, uh, in measurements of uh, um, losses and, and so on, I would like to, to have uh, his uh, expert opinion on, on, this, uh, on this challenge. Okay. Thank you, Giacomo. I, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, I, uh, the presentations were very nice. Thank you, for, thank you Gemma, for, for the detailed description. And it's, uh, I think Gemma uh, con concludes very nicely. She states uh, that actually further work is needed in order to, uh, by comparing uh, prediction results with, um, with, with real performance measure data. And that's something which, which we also started during that exercise. So we, we, uh, we uh, compiled some experience on the aspect. And what, what, what came across for us to be uh, key messages in, in, in that sense where, number one, we know actually too little about the renovation measures that have been executed uh, after, after building completion. So when we want to predict the energy performance of the building stock in our neighborhoods or in our city, uh, we, could, uh, we can always make use of the cadastral data, which in the Netherlands, the Netherlands is freely available. But uh, what we are missing is what, what happened between the um, erection of the building and, uh, and today, uh, how many renovation measures were applied and what were their consequences on the energy use actually. Another aspect uh, which, uh, which we uh, were exposed to when uh, trying to predict the absolute performance of, of our neighborhood uh, was that the data we, we were given with regards or we, we were provided with uh, from the utilities, energy utilities, there were mostly uh, uh, aggregated data for groups of buildings due to privacy reasons. And uh, then we received uh, mostly two numbers, uh, the electricity use and the gas use for up to uh, 20 post postcodes. 
um, for a period of one, one year. And then those data were all actually pre-processed. So they were uh, processed and corrected for the weather conditions varying from year to year. And they were also uh, uh, corrected for the different quality of gas that is being used uh, to, to provide, uh, to, to, to serve for heating. And so we have to deal with uh, different uncertainties. And we, those uncertainties were all manageable, uh, depending on which uh, data set you used for the climate data. You could, could correct for weather. And you could also assume that the uh, uh, caloric value of the gas does not change so much from year to year. So that could be excluded as well. But what was very important uh, that we came across buildings that used gas for heating for uh, uh, domestic hot water, as well as for cooking. And then we had buildings where we only used gas for, 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 dom for domestic hot water, where they were using electricity for heating and also electricity for cooking. And that's something which we, um, together with the updated uh, use data or, or, or refurbishment data, would be very uh, would be very very valuable to uh, uh, obtain when conducting those sort of validations. So my point being, Giacomo, is simply I think it's very important to have that information available with regards to the stage state state of renovation of the uh, building, as well as the uh, uh, gas use of the use of fossil fuels actually in in those uh, specific buildings, and uh, that all if we want to get access to the data, we certainly need to uh, take into account the privacy aspects yeah. for, for our citizens. And um, there are workarounds and the partners we were working with, at least here in the Netherlands, were very accessible and willing to work with us, but there are, there are limits to that. And I think we need to clearly address the limits as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, uh, specifically also for having uh, um, taken uh, care of uh, uh, adapting the building physics library for Netherlands, uh, starting from the German ones available from Simstad. But let's uh, take the last uh, uh, chance to have uh, another important message here to share in terms of future outlook. I would like to see if, in your opinion, the reuse of the methodology presented so far can support, at least to what extent, can support the implementation of uh, the actions related to energy efficiency, which are present in the recovery and resilience uh, nation, national plans. And uh, I would like to, to benefit from the um, presence, if he's still present, uh, um, our uh, colleague uh, Dimitris from ENER, Dimitri, I don't know if you would like to, to, to say a few words also in terms of the very active uh, um, period in which many directives are being reviewed uh, in, 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 in your unit. I don't know, would you like to say something, Dimitris? Uh, hi, hi, Giacomo, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, uh, I'm always happy to join uh, all this uh, high technology uh, uh, approaches that you use so from from my uh, from our perspective i mean uh, what i would like to share with you is that uh, we are uh, heading now to the revision of the eppd and we are really trying to find as much data as possible so all this uh, uh, new methods and approaches are very useful, uh, not only, uh, I would say, I mean, we, we have been in uh, touch and we have been discussing about synergies with the Building Stock Observatory, with CPC databases, how to find the harmonized way to uh, check, uh, to, to assess uh, EPCs and all these methods, but now, I think that uh, all this exercise makes sense in uh, view of what we're going to propose in terms of the uh, of the revision of the APPD and I'm referring to the mandatory minimum energy performance standards. So this will be standards to be applied uh, minimum standards to be applied on top of what we have for major innovations and uh, you know the cost optimal standards to be applied when a building is uh, to be sold or rented out. For example, uh, 
uh, if you have to uh, rent the house, then you need to make sure that, uh, um, for example, uh, this building is uh, above uh, energy EPC class uh, D. This is just an example. And it will also be applied uh, horizontally in an effort to uh, ban, to get rid of the worst performing buildings. So uh, we are trying to find solutions to see how can we actually uh, uh, assess and uh, define or even uh, you know determine the worst performing buildings. Uh, it could be through EPCs, for example, but so far, uh, only 10% of the whole building stock have an issue with the NEPC because it's not, you know, uh, uh, applied to all buildings, but only it's related, associated with some transactions. So these methods could provide uh, an indication uh, of the building stock who which doesn't, you know, the the, sec, the the part of the building stock without a, a good performance with high heating demands and so on. Um, in any case, uh, I uh, just to mention again that uh, the open consultation for the uh, EPPD revision is open until the 22nd of June. Uh, just, uh, and okay, it's gonna be, uh, it's going to be a huge process. We are now uh, 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 trying to develop the impact assessment, of course, with synergies with many, many other things and other uh, 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 regulation packages under revision, like the Global Directive, the E Direct Directive, the ETS scheme, and so, so on. Uh, uh, it, our proposal uh, will come by the end of the year, and then trials will start. So we are gonna have uh, time to discuss and see uh, how we can further explore synergies. And at the same time, uh, we are also trying to launch the third phase of the Building Stock Observatory. Yeah. It started back in 2016. And then we had another contract, and now we're trying to revise it. All these approaches are already, uh, you know, in our mind. Uh, so maybe we can still uh, exchange some views, and uh, of course, with uh, the other participants, if they have something to share with us, uh, either directly with me or uh, maybe uh, through you. Uh, we're happy to accommodate any thoughts, any solutions, anything that could uh, support both the PD vision, but also the next phase of the uh, building stock observatory. But uh, yes, these uh, type of approaches are going to come, I think, uh, more and more into our life together with the exploration of big data, so all these new digital approaches have to somehow find their way to, 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 to the reality of our uh, Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitrios, for having shared Thank this uh, encouraging, uh, uh, let's say, st uh, stimulus to, to continue to, to, to work on it. Uh, I think we are a bit uh, out of time. Uh, Simon, I think... Uh, it's time to to go with another uh, with the last poll, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, it's time to go to the last poll and to the last section, let's say, of this of this webinar today, uh, the question and answers. Uh, so I will just check if there are any uh, questions or comments at the moment. If not, maybe we will warm up uh, if the audience is not warmed up yet uh, with the next set of questions. Um, so maybe uh, please uh, consider now when you've been listening to, 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 to the presentations uh, by Giacomo, 
Volker and Rema, and also to all the comments uh, given as well. So how do you see, uh, or what do you think about the presented methodology that can be reused in your city or town? So uh, one means the lowest uh, valued, five the highest, the most uh, appropriate. The second question is, uh, what do you see as the main obstacle for using such a methodology in your city or town or living environment? And last but uh, not least, as you can see, it also mentioned by, by Giacomo in the uh, key conclusions. So to what extent the methodology showed can support the implementation of the energy efficiency related actions in the national resilience and recovery activities. So I like national plans for resilience and recovery that are quite, let's say, um, popular at the moment. So please, uh, let's uh, take us maybe a few seconds more uh, for, uh, uh, addressing these questions. Maybe in the meantime, you will also think about, on, maybe you can add something and comment uh, later on in the, in, the, in, the first, in the last few minutes that are left for, 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 for our webinar. So, okay, I will end the polling now. So what are the results? So I will share the results. So obviously the most, uh, so the, the most, the majority of you thinks in the, Great for to 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 assess the the, the presented methodology to be reused uh, as the main obstacle. You see the lack of an accurate building physics library, and as well uh, with uh, most of you has said uh, at the level four that the methodology showed can support the implementation of the energy efficiency in the national. Uh, resilience and recovery activities. Uh, I don't know, uh, Giacomo, maybe would you like to comment somehow the, the, the results of the poll, the last poll? Uh, I would say that uh, the, the, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's encouraging that uh, they are uh, confirming our expectations that uh, despite we uh, we were not able to, uh, because the, the overall ecosystem of energy efficiency and, and, and predictions of energy demand uh, is, is quite complex, and we could not, uh, uh, let's say, touch at the same level of details all the aspects. So we were aware of uh, uh, possible uh, sub sampling of the overall uh, knowledge which is behind, but uh, the, the, I think that the main goal achieved is the, the fact that uh, um, many aspects have been uh, thoroughly dealt with, uh, are going, will, have been documented, and uh, a series of reports will be soon uh, available. And so we hope that uh, we have provided a quite uh, um, robust and solid base for further uh, analysis and, and, and further work that hopefully and I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll, we'll follow. So these, these are my concluding remarks and uh, I, I thank you very much all the uh, attendees and the speakers and especially for all the hard work they made in, uh, in the context of this uh, collaboration agreement. And uh, my, my, my wish is to, uh, to continue to stay in touch because these are activities that, uh, that somehow will, will continue in the, in the future. Um, I don't know, Simon, if you would like to, to add anything more also. Oh, I don't think so, because as, as you said, as you mentioned already, we are already a bit late. Uh, there are no additional additional comments or questions in the chat box. So I would suggest that we are slowly closing. So thank you. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, Focus and Gema. And thank you all the commenters as well today. Uh, of course, as mentioned, uh, Giacomo, so there will be uh, GRC technical reports also published very, very soon. Uh, to be informed about these activities, please join us. There is a community that you will be able to be, let's say, automatically uh, notified about these or any other activities we are doing on the LISA, you can follow us as well on the, on the YouTube channel. 
Uh, last but not least, I would like to invite you to subscribe to our uh, YouTube, cha uh, YouTube channel. Sorry, before I was men 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 meaning the, the Twitter channel. I was <laughs> I wanted to, to invite you also to the YouTube channel uh, of Elise, where you can uh, uh, access to not only to this webinar that will be that was recorded today, but also to all the past uh, uh, webinars. So thank you once again, and I uh, hope to, to see you soon at uh, some other edition of uh, uh, Elisa webinar. Have a nice day and good afternoon.